This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. This is Marketing Mojo on Resource Center and I'm Lim Sun Hing. Branding a country. I assume this is no easy task, what with all the different stakeholders. The overt branding for our country that comes to mind is the Tourism Board's Malaysia Truly Asia. But branding is more than just TV commercials on primetime television. Rick Ko Baksong is a consultant in branding, CSR and communication strategy. He's the CEO of Integrative CSR Consulting and also an editor and author of some 20 books including Brand Singapore, How Nation Branding Built Asia's Leading Global City, published in 2011, and also Perpetual Spring, Singapore's Gardens by the Bay, published in 2012. Welcome. Hi. How different is branding a country from branding a company or product? I think to help people to get a better grasp of of the subject, I actually would like to draw an analogy with the character of a person. So if you think of the character of a person, you have certain impression of yourself that your work colleagues might have, but your spouse or your other relatives and friends will have a different perspective. But they all make up that person. So it's multifaceted, in other words. Correct. In the same way, a country has, of course, has many facets, maybe well, more faster than a person. And the total brand is actually a a kind of aggregate or a snapshot of all those different elements. So it's a subject that needs to be looked at quite broadly. That's one idea. And then the other important idea is to draw the distinction between branding and brand building. Branding is very conscious and deliberate activity. Like, for instance, you mentioned the Malaysia Malaysia Truly Asia. Malaysia Truly Asia. That's branding. Because it's very conscious, you probably hire a consultant to help in the process, come up with a nice way of presenting yourself to the world, and then you actually have to spend money and time and effort to get that message out there, and you hope that it connects. Uh So that's that's very deliberate, Uh it can be expensive, but it's certainly visible and prominent. And most people obviously can see that aspect of how a brand is built up. But brand building, which is the much more holistic approach to the subject, includes all the other aspects. In other words, every other kind of input to the impressions of people outside, as well as inside your country, of your national brand. So, for instance, a tourist arrives in KL, takes a taxi. The interaction with the taxi driver is an input to his or her impression of Malaysia. Sure. So, and, but that's something no civil servant can control. But can control in the sense of educating the, the taxi drivers. But you did say that it is in a brand building, it's an activity that is done deliberately though, right? Brand building, yes. Well, it's deliberate and it's also something that just happened that's incidental. There's also that incidental part of it. Uh, the example that I gave, a conversation of a taxi driver, is the incidental brand building. I mean, it's not something that anybody sets out to do. I don't think the average taxi driver sets out to think that he's contributing to the international reputation of his country, but by his actions, he is actually giving an input. We'll come back to the different different stakeholders, but still going back to this whole notion about branding for a country. And you say branding has to be in some ways quite deliberate. But when did Singapore, in a sense, consciously said, okay, we need to have a brand Singapore? I don't know exactly when, but it was certainly not from the beginning. In the earliest days, from independence in the 60s and 70s, it was not seen as branding. It was seen as tourism advertising. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the whole concept of branding is fairly recent idea. I mean, if you, if you went back to the 70s and you tried to talk about branding, I think not many people would understand what you're talking about. I mean, they understood advertising. You're right. But they didn't understand branding. There is a crucial difference. So in the early days, it was marketing and advertising. It's only in the in recent, recent years. I don't know exactly when, but I think it probably would be sometime in the, not any earlier than the 90s, when it was thought of as branding, as what we know it today. Okay, if there was no conflict Effort. So if the effort then only started in the 90s, all the advertising was still trying to create a certain kind of image, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, well, the people who were doing it may not have been directly conscious of branding, but they were very conscious in advertising, in tourism promotion. And those are actually subsets of the country brand. So it's not that it wasn't conscious, it was conscious, but there wasn't any holistic branding effort the way that it is today. So so different departments, different arms of the government, each will be doing their own thing without having anything kind of integrated. Unlike today where we kind of think of, like you say, branding as a kind of a holistic thing. 
taking into consideration how each stakeholder will have its own int- his or her own interest and how they all push out their own agenda. Yes. Yeah? Yes. In this kind of a context that you say it kind of evolved in some ways, right? So what's the process? What has happened in the 90s that allowed the kind of branding of Singapore? Because one of the, your theses is that without branding, Singapore would not exist. Yes. Yes, I think the branding as an as a concept, as a practice, and as an industry became more formalized. And I think today, many more people understand the theory of branding, but practice is a totally different thing. <laughs> I think even today, well, there's still silo mentality. There's still the feature of people doing their own thing. And I think that well, there was an effort in the early 2000s, a concerted effort to bring everything together. But I, I can share with you that from Singapore's approach, they have lost a bit of momentum on that. Uh, lost that opportunity to coordinate things. And we've kind of gone, drifted back the old mode of different agencies, more or less doing their own thing. Although, at, at its core, the essence, brand attribute and the core values are consistent. So the, the consistency is there, the starting point, but certainly not in the output. So in the context of values, then what values hold all these different outputs together? There are certain attributes that Singapore is already known for and which the people who are behind the promotion of the country um, want to advance. And these include the, the fact that the country is, is known for being very efficient. I mean, things work. The diversity of things that you can do in tourism. And if you're doing business, it's easy to come in, set up your business and get it running. Everything is within easy reach. Everything can be accomplished easily. All these among some of the attributes, and these are promoted by the different agencies. Uh, well, one thing I need to add is that there is the concept of the big brand, but there's also the concept of sub-brands. In other words, you have a sub-brand for tourism, and then one for investment, one for attracting talent to your manpower. So in each sphere, the work is quite conscious and quite deliberate and quite coordinated. And that is a good thing, but it allows for some diversity still. But there is some sharing also f- amongst these different components, I mean, tourism has also, like you said, the kind of things you can do, but there is also the sense of being safe. And then in terms of trying to attract talent to Singapore, the whole notion of Singapore is a safe place, efficient place. I mean, these values do kind of permeate the different arms, yeah? Yes, yes. Now, my question is, how deliberate was this whole process to kind of say, okay, I mean, looking from perspective as an outsider, looking at Singapore, you can say, yeah, in my mind, Singapore means this. You know, it's quite consistent. Mm-hmm. Was there a deliberate effort to kind of create this consistency? Or was it merely that, okay, we need to be efficient, so we became efficient, and then we became known for becoming efficient. I know we wanted to be clean, and then then we became known for being a clean city. Oh, in that sense, it was very coordinated and and deliberate. I mean, like, for instance, the people who promote foreign direct investment, it has been very, very consistent. It's the agency, I, I worked there for five years. I was in charge of engaging the managing foreign media relations. And there is a set of value propositions for the country, which is worked on on a daily basis. You know, every day you try to make it better. And it's something that is promoted on a daily basis and it has been done consistently for more than 50 years. In that sphere, it is done on a direct marketing approach. In other words, you try to talk directly to the decision makers, the chairman and CEOs of top companies, mostly in the developed economies of the world. So it's very, very uh, conscious, deliberate and targeted. Rick Ho of CSR Consulting. He is also the author of Brand Singapore, How Nation Branding Built Asia's Leading Global City. We are talking about branding a country. Coming up, keeping and guarding the brand. This is Marketing Mojo and Resource Center, BFM 89.9, the business station. You're listening to Marketing Mojo on Resource Center and I'm Lim Sun Hing speaking with Rick Ko, who is from CSR Consulting and the author of Brand Singapore, How Nation Branding Built Asia's Leading Global City. And of course, we're talking about how a country brands itself. Now, Rick, you know, in some ways, countries are not like companies. Companies, you know, in a sense that you have the board deciding and everybody following. And if you don't like it, you get out of the company, right? If you, you fire people who are giving the wrong messages. With a country, it's a bit different. So who is in charge? Who has taken charge to create this brand? Earlier, we talked about the conscious and targeted branding, but there's also the incidental input of making up the brand. Yeah, like you said, the taxi driver's conversation. It would be harder for the government or the state to influence and control. Well, it can try to influence, but it can never completely control. So there are things that the state does, and there are things that, uh, in Singapore's case, the state is dominant in many spheres of society and is 
therefore able to be quite in control of the messaging for the international brand in most spheres. But there's also the sphere of the, the private sector, you know, the corporations and companies do. And this is not just Singaporean companies, but also foreign companies who operate out of Singapore. Mm-hmm. And then there's also what we call the people sector. And then you could have civil society, you could just ordinary people. I'll just make a couple of comments for each of the sectors. For the private sector, my feeling is that there is actually a lot of untapped potential. The average business person in Singapore does not naturally feel that he should project his nationality. In fact, they take a much more pragmatic approach. Sometimes there is even a kind of diffidence or even a lack of confidence in projecting the Singaporean. So for instance, if they're operating in a foreign country, they may not make it known very prominently that they are from Singapore. Mm -hmm. They may even be companies that try to pass off for... I mean, there is one company that operates in a foreign country that is mistaken for a UK company and they are quite happy to let that misperception <laughs> assist. Uh, so I think, you know, if you com- contrast that with, say, uh, the typical American businessman or even the Japanese businessman, I mean, the nationality is like oozes out of every pore. Right? Uh, that's certainly not the Singaporean natural instinct. Would it be now, fair to say that the Singapore brand is mostly the government's or the state's brand as opposed to the non-state? I think it's in a country where the government has been dominant in so many spheres for so long, it's only natural that something like the country brand would also have that feature. I I think it's it's only natural. If I could say something about the people sector, this imbalance, if you like, between the input from the state and the input from the people is also there, obviously. I mean, because there's a a power imbalance. I mean, no, no ordinary person can buy an advertisement in a major business newspaper, you know, that's a global mm. newspaper, you, 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 sure, you don't, sure. don't, don't have the resources to do that. <laughs> but there is has a change in the recent years in Singapore. We are seeing more ground-up energies. I think people are becoming more vocal. They certainly are more assertive in the political sphere and in society. We have civil society groups becoming more active and lobbying to protect heritage, or nature, and so on. And I think this, this rise of ground-up energies is a good thing for the country brand because it's an input that we haven't seen as much. Is there a difference between a country's brand and the government's brand? Yes, yes. Earlier we touched on the difference between the kind of like the mother brand and sub-brands. So you will certainly have a brand that people would kind of link with the government more than with the the private private sector or ordinary people. I mean, like things like law and order, political stability. I mean, these, of course, well, mainly in the purview of the state. So these aspects, people know where the state has the strongest influence. And the government itself, it has a brand, of course. I mean, the, the civil service has a kind of reputation. The ruling party has a reputation. And these are all input to the total impression of the country brand. So I assume, based on what you're saying to me, in a sense, the brand is also an evolving thing. So has the Singapore brand changed? Has it changed? Over time, yeah. Yes, yes, it has. I think, for instance, if you take one aspect of uh, nightlife or, you know, enjoying the good life. The kind of amenities that a global city can provide. I think Singapore was perceived to be a much more uptight place, right, where probably, well, even seen as a as a cultural desert and uh, there's not much that you can do at mm-hmm. night. I think that has been almost completely overturned. I, I think the arts calendar, it used to be that you could catch every major show in town. It's, it's impossible now because the arts calendar is so full. It's physically impossible to catch every every show. And the nightlife, there are so many options that it, it, you can't keep up with all the new night spots that are opening up. So there was a period in, in the early... 2000s, I think there, there were certain regulations that were changed. Uh, some were uh, quite drastic, like we moved from a complete ban on casinos to all-out promotion. That's like a, a complete U-turn. There was a time when um, there was, people were talking about the uh, loosening the regulations on bar top dancing. It's kind of gone out of fashion, but that some of these kinds of uh, regulations were kind of consigned to history. Uh, that's uh, one aspect of which we, I think we have certainly almost completely changed the picture. Yeah. I remember a time when I was uh, in Singapore. It was Singapore was known for a place where no, no chewing gum, hair must be above your ear and collar. So that also became part of the brand Singapore. Yes, it's kind of you know well something is unfortunate that those impressions have stuck. 
But I think it, it is also natural that certain impressions that you have of things that you get in your in your life kind of stick in your mind, and these have a kind of a stickiness that uh, it, it just won't go away, like, no matter what you do. In my book, Brand Singapore, I, I coined the term. I called it brand keloid. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a scar that you have on your body. Again, the analogy of a human body. You have a scar on your body. Or maybe once in a while, it might still itch a bit, but it's there, and you just have to you just have to live with it. You can't get rid of it. I mean, to remove it surgically would be quite uh, uh, painful. And it is impossible to, in order to erase it, you would have to go around the world to every country and change the minds of all those people who, who have this impression somewhere stuck in their memory. And, and you know that's impossible. <laughs> yeah. What does Singapore do to protect the brand? It does. Well, on a daily basis, of course, there is the state and corporations and even people, ordinary people, like for instance, a, a writer or a, or a singer, are doing things to protect their reputation. So all this activity is protective activity that you speak of, but it's being done not just by the state, but by, the, by companies. You know, as, as they protect their corporate reputation, they're actually also helping to defend people's impressions of, of, of the country. And, and if, if you're a writer or, or you know, you have, you have some influence in the world, you are also helping to protect people's sense of your country of origin. So it's done through, well, public relations and then some, some advertising. And essentially, it's also what you say and do. Like, it's like, you know, the way that you sustain people's impression of, of your personal character it's what you say and do yeah this is a subject that we can talk on and on and on because i find it you know, branding a country is incredibly fascinating in some ways more fascinating than branding a particular company or a, or a company's services because i mean you have such competing voices not only competing voices you have people with the money to do it or segments with the money to do it and segments without the money to do it but they have now with social network yeah that's right. That's right. And there's, of course, all, there's the positive and there's also the negative. I mean, if you're an ordinary person, one of your blog posts or YouTube videos could go viral and you're just an ordinary person with a computer and an internet, internet connection, you could make a, a dramatic change in how your country is perceived. Anybody has that capability today. So that's certainly true, yeah. Rick Ko, CEO of Integrative Consulting, whose works focuses on branding, CSR, and communication strategy. He's also an editor and author of several books, including Brand Singapore, How Nation Branding Built Asia's Leading Global City, and also Perpetual Spring, Singapore's Gardens by the Bay. This is Marketing Mojo and Resource Center, and I'm Lim Sun Heng, BFM 89.9, The Business Station. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.